I'll just I'll crack on, shall I? Okay, hello everyone, thank you. Um, so, my name's Josh. Um, I'm a PhD student at um, University of Exeter. So, uh, my doctoral research is um, looking at the law, particularly the international law of underwater cultural heritage and the issues with that, um, and therefore looking at the uh, UNESCO Convention, particularly, and the obviously the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Um, and the implementation issues with that, how does that work? So particularly looking beyond territorial waters, um, I'm generally looking at the whole thing as an integrated perspective, but focusing perhaps on beyond territorial waters, so 12 nautical miles of most states or uh, 24 nautical miles um, if you have a contiguous zone. So looking in the EEZ or the continental shelf or the deep sea bed. Um, my particular focus is on Increasing collaboration, increasing cooperation. I take quite a critical perspective of the law of the sea. Um, I show that reality, we're not really doing enough to protect cultural heritage out there. There's, there's a real lack of law, and I'll explain a bit of that. So um, what I'm seeking is perhaps further collaboration, further cooperation. Like they do in environmental law, um, they have to have sort of regional collaborative um, movements. So you've got like the Common Fisheries Policy, which you've seen in the news, or the OSPAR Convention in the Northeast Atlantic for pollution. Um, or the North East Atlantic Fisheries Commission, you need all these sort of further cooperative efforts between states to actually make things happen. You can't just say, let's cooperate and hope for the best. So, um, so I'm kind of looking at you know, how that could work for collaborative, uh, for underwater cultural heritage. So um, a general aspect of that, sort of a part of that, um, oh, and I will say, that, sorry, today I'm just talking about the, the North Sea. I'm taking a sort of case study of the North Sea and I'll explain why. Um, and looking at a particular issue within that, which is relying on uh, just nation states to make decisions over what's arguably universal cultural heritage. So a, a part of that is uh, looking at cult underwater cultural heritage as a common concern of, of humankind. You might have seen about the common heritage of mankind concept in the, the UN Convention Law of the Sea, and for a variety of reasons it doesn't really apply to underwater cultural heritage. It's mostly concerned with the exploitation of, of natural resources on the, on the seabed and things like that. So it doesn't really apply. But arguably what could apply is this concept that keeps arising in things like climate change treaties or the, you know, the World Heritage Convention or human rights treaties, which is about doing things that are for the benefits of for humankind or mankind um, or in the interests of humanity. And um, it slightly changes the concept, really. It redefines um, how we do international law. And what it does is instead of saying that these things are just the remit of nation states and it makes cultural heritage something that states just own as an asset and they can exploit freely. What it rather does is it slightly shifts that perspective towards saying that this belongs to the international community. It looks at sustainability, the idea of um, sustainable development, um, and it looks at the idea of intergenerationality, so thinking of future generations and previous generations as well and other generations today around the world, so thinking about equality as well. Um, and so it sort of takes a more of a universal perspective. Um, not like the World Heritage Convention, which is a, you know, more concerned with perhaps outstanding value and, and a very sort of strict, strict definition, but more just looking at everything as, as a more sort of, from a more universal perspective. So it shifts, it shifts the, um, the emphasis slightly away from nation states and perhaps towards more you know, the international community. What can we do as an international community to protect underwater cultural heritage? Um, for the purpose of this presentation and, and a lot of my research focusing on the North Sea, I think it's a really you know, perfect test area for what I do um, and for what I'm looking at. I mean, obviously in the North Sea specifically, we're only talking about continental shelves or um, exclusive economic zones. And the countries there, as you know, a lot of you say France and Belgium are members of the UNESCO Convention. Um, Netherlands are joining, as we know. Germany appear to be joining as well. Um, I think Denmark are making murmurings to join and obviously the UK haven't joined, which is a real shame as we were talking about earlier, um, but they do adhere to the UNESCO rules, and similarly Norway hasn't joined, but um, does also adhere to the UNESCO, the, the rules and the annex as well. So there's an interesting mix there of, of states as well, to, for, for the purposes of my analysis. I have another image I picked up, it's quite pretty, I mean, I think these are recorded losses, or you know, whether there's estimated to be reps or known reps, there might be many more that are unknown, or, or some of them might be um, false, I don't know, but there's certainly a, a pretty image of some of the, the wrecks we anticipate being out in that area. Um, it's, it's no secret, obviously we all know the North Sea is an incredibly important um, uh, sea for maritime history. It was uh, massively traded upon, it's been, it's, it is still the busiest, you know, one of the busiest sea areas in the, in the, in the world. 
that's got a massive history there. There were times when it would have been easier to get between the sort of ports and harbours uh, around countries, and it would have been almost a travel inland to countries. It was, it was really heavily traded um, throughout history. And obviously there's naval battles and various other things that have taken place there as well, very significant ones. Um, and presently now it's, it's really threatened by lots of pressures, particularly offshore development, offshore renewable energy, um, hydrocarbons, dredging, fishing, trawling, and so on. And obviously, as you all know, um, uh, it's really key as well in terms of prehistoric research as well. Prehistoric research on the continental shelf in the North Sea is, is really significant, and it's really uh, important for that. So sort of Mesolithic and, and Paleolithic um, artifacts keep turning up, um, and there's a lot of research that needs to be done on the sort of early hunter-gatherers, early man, um, and how they settled along coastal parts that would have been coastal parts as the, uh, you know, when the Ice Age um, retreated and the sea levels rose beforehand, there would have been lots of coastal parts, lots of rivers, lots of um, islands and various other things that, that still um, have lots of information and, and stories to be told. So anyway, so I was going to talk to you about what law there is protecting um, cultural heritage in the North Sea. From my perspective, with my research, um, this is it, essentially. Um, this is essentially, I would say, what the law is. Um, because in reality, when you go beyond territorial waters, once you go out into the sea, there is really still a lack of um, legal protection. There's a lack of real normative law. Okay, there might be some behavioural norms. There might be commitments to, you know, we'll cooperate, we'll do what we can. Um, but in terms of actual enforceable law, what there is there for underwater cultural heritage, there's still remarkably little. Um, so... Just to say on that, you know, a big part of what I look at is say, you know, about how the law is, uh, the, ocean, the ocean is pretty much a lawless space. So wherever you look in the ocean at the moment, whether it be overfishing, um, piracy is still rife, uh, human rights abuses, trafficking, smuggling, uh, whatever you look at, it's still rife um, in the ocean, in the high seas. So we've got big problems with how we govern the oceans, and I'm taking quite a critical approach to that. Um, and as you know, with the UN Convention Law of the Sea, some of you might know that it promoted the idea of the mare liberum, which is the idea that, you know, the freedom of the seas um, and that nation states are only really interested um, with enforcing against their own vessels or their own nationals, otherwise they don't really care. So they're, only, they're more interested in exploiting the resources of the sea, but not with taking on the responsibilities um, for, for its protection. And in the UN uh, Convention Law of the Sea, when it came to um, underwater cultural heritage, um, there was only two sort of vague, quite vacuous commitments to um, to cooperate um, and generally to you know to just treat uh, UCH in, in a way that's um, generally going to you know care for it. But that's all they really say. It doesn't go beyond that. So that's why we had the UNESCO Convention because obviously the UN Convention was very weak and didn't really offer anything. Um, and from my perspective, having looked through it, it doesn't really offer a lot more. Because what the UN, what the UNESCO Convention does in the areas of the continental shelf and in the in the deep sea bed as well, it says the same thing: states should just cooperate. And it's supposed to have created this cooperation regime where states will get together and talk. But it doesn't say much more than states should just get together and talk when they need to. That's all it really says. Um, it doesn't actually give any firm commitments as to what states should be doing to cooperate, um, or how to enforce against that, or how to pick out states and say, "Look, you're not properly cooperating. You're not doing enough." There's, it's not really a normative commitment. Um, some people talk about protecting, for example, natural resources, which you could do through Article 77 of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, and how you could indirectly protect your um, underwater cultural heritage. Say you might say there's barnacles encrusted on a wreck or something, and you can say that you can protect those barnacles as your natural resources. Obviously, uh, you know, I'm critical of how that works generally. I think that's quite an ineffective way of um, conducting law, but um, on the same breath as well, it doesn't really add anything beyond what we already had when it was negotiated in 1982. We already had that Article 77, we've had it for 30, 40 years, and you can see how ineffective it's been. So that's why both conventions anticipate regional cooperation. They both very clearly, explicitly state we're expecting states to further cooperate and to do more on a regional or bilateral basis. Um, and I don't need to preach to you as to the benefits of regional collaboration, regional cooperation, why we need to co cooperate with our regional partners. Um, I mean, obviously, they're, they're numerous, and particularly in, in fields like this, um, enhanced in enforcement and surveillance cooperation, so picking, you know, finding looters and things like that to make sure they're properly um, prosecuted, avoiding regulatory weak spots uh, through legal harmonisation of things like ports of convenience, or whatever it may be. 
pooling of resources and expertise. So that's both, you know, legal expertise and legal enforcement, but also research-based as well, the importance of academic um, collaboration, um, shared databases and technology, and, and more effective and efficient means of management. So these are some of the examples of things I've been looking at in my um, thesis. But for the purpose of this presentation, I just wanted to look at the North Sea and perhaps more directly some of the law and, and the issues with, with um, UCH there. And what I'm saying with this particular presentation today is the issues with how we assess significance, certainly what we refer to in our English, in the UK legislation about assessing significance of UCH. Um, and I've picked out sort of two, I've separated into two issues. There's a direct threat where we are obviously in the UK, for example, still able to salvage certain wrecks, um, which is certainly an antiquated system, um, I feel, and certainly needs, certainly needs updating the, the fact that you still have the opportunities to salvage certain wrecks. Um, uh, without, you know, the, the way it's certainly currently run under the sort of protection of wreck and things like that, there's certainly a need for some kind of updating of the law. Or you might have wreck removal, which is, say, you're engaging in a uh, development or something and there's a known wreck or a known um, sort of <coughs> cultural area that you're able to then remove that, you know, that you've, you've said, OK, we should remove that so that we can have this development. Well, as we all know, it relies on the sort of UNESCO rules and the letter convention, the idea of in situ preservation is the first option. Well, the question then becomes, when is it no longer a first option? And you talked about that earlier, I think, about, um, you know, it's not, it's not the only option. It is meant to be just the first option. But then the question becomes, when do you override that? And it usually puts the heritage agencies in each, in each nation state, of course. So in the UK, we have um, Historic England, obviously, who are responsible for advising, um, whether it be um, the government or the MOD when it comes to the Protection of the Nature Remains Act or obviously um, the MMO with the um, Marine Coastal Access Act or of course you've got the um, Ancient Monuments and Areas Act as well so they, um, so they can advise on, on all those legislations and give guidance as to whether UCH is, is of any importance or significance or whether the threats are particularly um, serious. Um, but we don't know how those assessments are being carried out. We know that they've got statutory remits and we know they give these lovely guidances to what they should be doing, but we don't really know. And of course, they've got to consider socioeconomic benefits of these developments. So it might well be you've got an offshore wind farm that's going to bring in thousands of jobs. It's going to boost the economy by billions of pounds or however much it's going to, to, to boost the economy. And of course, it's of massive interest to the UK government that that gets put through. Um, but we don't know how the assessment's being carried out. If they say, well, actually, there could potentially be some really important um, prehistoric um, areas here that, that might need protecting but of course they're not going to want to stand up against um, the sort of consideration of the socio-economic benefits so I'm not saying that you can necessarily stand against all socio-economic benefits but I think you need to make sure these assessments are carried out fairly um, and at least in a transparent manner um, and similarly indirect threats the same sort of principle applies so here we might be talking about the sort of indirect effects from construction, development, offshore dredging and so on um, this is certainly UNESCO Convention is particularly poor on it. Just says has just one thing that just says states should avoid indirect harm. Um, that's all it really says. Um, and EU legislation, which has obviously been translated into UK law. Um, so we've got the Environmental Impact Assessment Directive or the Strategic Environmental Assessment Directive, the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. They all refer to the historic environment and the importance of considering the historic environment. And you know the marine plans that are being created at the moment by the Marine Management Organisation. They're looking at, you know, they often say you need to consider the historic environment in all the marine spatial planning we're doing. But it, we don't really know how the, whether that's been done. So when you say you need to consider the historic environment, how do you know that's been done effectively? How do you know that hasn't been carried out, has been carried out? Um, so it's all very vague, it's very difficult to enforce, and it's relying very much on an ad, ad hoc assessment there and then. So it's down again to the, nas the national curators to say, well, actually, yeah, that's... That's been carried out effectively, so you carry on and bulldoze through it. That's okay. We don't really know how these assessments should be carried out, or, or you know, again, the, the lack of transparency or, or you know, monitoring. Um, and similarly, there's an over reliance on industry codes of practice and uh, codes of conduct and protocols. So I give some examples there. Similarly, they rely then on the developers or the retained archaeologists who are paid by the companies to make sure things go through. Um, or obviously, again, national heritage agencies to continually monitor. So there's a lack of transparency. Again, how effective are these um, um, assessments being carried out? And you know, what sort of criteria are they using and things like that? So 
So, uh, and actually, this is just one aspect of my research, but uh, the, the problem then becomes if you're looking at universal heritage, or some of this might be certainly regionally important heritage, but I would argue it's all universally important. So, as I say, prehistoric research of early man, I think that's important to everyone around the world, um, and something that we're all, we all you know, have an interest in making sure is, is protected. Um, but there's a problem in environmental law that you, it fails to take account of externalities if you have um, a national country that's or, or a, an individual that's responsible for making their decisions without taking account of the costs. So what you're doing is you're getting the benefits of the decision without absorbing the costs. So, for example, you might engage in a development, but you don't actually absorb the cost of the pollution that pollutes the country next door. Um, and the same happens with um, decisions that might be happening inside exclusive economic zones or cultural uh, uh, continental shelves. The states might be taking decisions um, to engage in development, but they're not take, absorbing all the costs because actually it's around the world that's going to lose that cultural heritage, not necessarily just the, 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 the nation state. So this leads to free riding, and it's similar to the issue of tragedy of the commons. It's why we have cooperation between states over things like fishing and things like that. We need to have that because otherwise states um, are prone to short-termism um, and prone to um, engaging in selfish decisions because they don't absorb the costs of the decision. Um, and the other big part of that, of course, is it's difficult to quantify um, cultural or non-economic values. It's very easy to think, okay, this is going to create thousands of jobs, it's going to create a massive boost in the economy, which is great, and it is important, um, but it's very difficult to then quantify intergenerational and future generations, um, you know, cultural value and things like that. So that, um, again, requires transparency and clearer guidance as to how these assessments should be carried out, and some way um, that you can also argue the other angle because obviously it's very easy to argue the socio-economic angle but there's no there's nobody really um, arguing the case for the cultural value or the social value it's, it's always the the economic value that wins out and we saw that a bit you know perhaps with the, the Brexit debate as well when I was very much campaigning about the importance of environmental cooperation and things like that but that wasn't what featured at all it was very much about um, you know taking back control and, and the economic issue and all that sort of stuff um, so, yeah, so anyway, I, I guess what I'm saying is perhaps a, a, a hypothesis of my research is that we need better regional collaboration and cooperation. Um, maybe a North East Atlantic network. I've talked to you about a North Sea Heritage Network, but something that provides advocacy um, and something that then starts getting states together cooperating. So that's good for, for, from the academic perspective as well, from the research perspective, because that can improve the sort of funding and mobility of research and the quality of research as well pulling together of expertise, um, but also it can improve this collective action and coordinating activities and avoiding harmful externalities, which is the kind of thing you'd see in all environmental treaties um, on a regional basis. Um, similarly, as I say, it empowers the community to enforce and make sure that underwater cultural heritage is being protected and that this is being thought about and it gives an extra voice or some extra power to make sure that things are being considered. Um, and another reason as well, slightly related, is that the, it ensures larger spaces, spaces can be reserved as well. So say the UK wants to develop on the Dogger Bank and it wants to build this large wind farm it's building. Well, you might find actually parts of that might want to be protected. And what you could say, well, is why don't you build on the other aspects of the Dogger Bank that's perhaps you know, less likely to carry certain heritage in exchange for making sure that part is protected for the region so that other states would be interested in also protecting that aspect too. Um, so that's sort of a part of my research and, and a part of the reason why I'm arguing for, you know, and starting to look at what sort of collaboration can we do. And for my research, I'm looking at it by comparing cooperation over fisheries in, in um, the European sort of northeast Atlantic region, uh, cooperation over pollution and things like that, and seeing what we can learn from that and what's been effective in terms of underwater cultural heritage and what we can take from those. So I think I've probably, probably done quite well at the time, actually. Um, so, thank you everyone, uh, everyone. Um, if there's any questions, obviously, I suppose we'll talk about them in the discussion. <laughs> Cheers, thank you.